Hello, how are you all? I hope you all had a wonderful week. It has been a beautiful sunny week. On and off, it's cloudy, but overall, it's really nice and pleasant, right? Tonight, I ask the Lord to continue to look upon each one of you, to give you peace, love, and joy. And may He come near to you to protect you and to guide you in this journey of life. We have been studying the book of Exodus. So far, we've read and studied up to the ninth plague. And looking at the plague so far, we have these observations. Death and proximity. You notice that each plague is becoming more severe and death was getting closer and closer to home. It was even knocking at the door when God sent the ninth plague of darkness. The darkness was not just the darkness that we experience at nighttime without the sun. It was a darkness that affected the Egyptians emotionally and physically. It was, as a rabbi, Jewish rabbi said, like the hell of death. Another observation, there was separation. There was a separation between the Egyptians and the Israelites, not only by location, but also the plagues that only affected the Egyptians and not the Israelites. Another observation, the plagues were an attack against the Egyptian source of power. The Egyptians had deified nature to such an extent that their religion had become a type of pantheism with a pantheon of about 2,000 gods and goddesses. In a sense, the plagues were successive acts of divine decreation, the undoing of the creation order of the people's understanding of the origin of Egypt. You know, for the Egyptians, they believed that goddess Ma'at embodied the truth, justice, order, and balance. And Pharaoh's responsibility was to set Ma'at in the place of Isfet, which is disorder. And moreover, Ma'at was more than just a goddess. She was also in control of the universe, make sure that it was in balance. Can you see it now? The Egyptian concept Ma'at was thrown into chaos during the 10 plagues, right? It was a direct challenge to the authority and ability of the king of Egypt, Pharaoh. In addition, if you observe, before nearly every plague, Moses was instructed to relate to Pharaoh the exact manner and effects of what would take place. Why did he do that? There are two reasons. Number one, to give the king the opportunity to avert the consequences. And number two, to make it impossible for Pharaoh to deny that the plagues had come from God, the true God. As each plague came upon Egypt, the effect on the land and the people would become more severe. And it was through this manifestation of his divine presence and power that God hoped to reveal the deficiencies of the religious belief of Egypt and draw the people to worship and honor him. And now tonight we are going to continue with the narrative in chapter 11. Let me read verse 1 to 3. And the Lord said to Moses, Yet one more plague shall I bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward, he will send you all from here. When he sends you off altogether, he will surely drive you out from here. Speak, pray in the hearing of the people, 
that every man borrow from his fellow men, and every woman from her fellow women, ornaments of silver and ornament of gold, and the Lord will grant the people favor in the eyes of the Egyptians. The man Moses too is very great in the land of Egypt, in the eyes of Pharaoh's servants, and in the eyes of the people. God told Moses that there'll be one more plague, the last one, and we know that it was the worst one. God told that after this last plague, Pharaoh for sure will drive them out. Himself and the people of Israel, even their animal, will be driven out. While driving out is more like forcing them to leave. In another word, Pharaoh will expel them from Egypt. Another instruction from God to Moses is to tell the people to ask their neighbors for ornaments of silver and ornaments of gold, which fulfill what he told Moses in the beginning at the burning bush, right in chapter three, verse twenty-one and twenty-two. But why? What's the reason behind why they had to ask the neighbor for silver and gold? Well, we're going to explain it through Deuteronomy chapter fifteen, twelve to fifteen. You see, there was an instruction given in Sinai later, after the Israelite left Egypt, an instruction that was necessary for a well-run, healthy society, and it was about a debt that slaveholder owed their slaves. So let me read, so you can see that. Verse twelve from Deuteronomy chapter fifteen. If any of your people, Hebrew men or women, sell themselves to you and serve you six years, in the seventh year you must let them go free, and when you release them, do not send them away empty-handed. Supply them liberally from your flock, your thresh threshing floor, and your wine press. Give to them as the Lord your God has blessed you. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you, and that is why I give you this command today. So, God's instruction is concerning at the time of releasing the slave of slaves. The owner of the slaves must generously shower them with material goods. Giving them a good material start for their new life, right? Because they've been slave with the slave owner, and they didn't have anything of their own. So how are they going to go out and live a normal life, right? So here too, before the last plague, God was telling Moses to tell the Israelites, who were slaves, right, to the Egyptians, so that they will tell the Egyptians. A、uh, slave owner to compensate them with this kind of generosity before they leave Egypt. The passage said, "And the Lord would grant the people favor in the eyes of the Egyptians." Indicates God would soften their hearts, and or perhaps the Egyptian would be afraid not to give after what they've witnessed so far. So we also read from this passage that Moses became very great in the eyes of Pharaoh's servants and of the people. So what's the change of heart? Didn't they used to despise him and the Hebrew people? Well, perhaps, although they initially looked down on Moses and his people, but now they have seen enough signs and wonders from Moses' God. And they began to believe that Moses God is the true God, and He is more powerful than their gods. Now, verses four to eight, it is a speech of Moses to Pharaoh. And Moses said, "Thus saith the Lord: Around midnight, I am going out in the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn." In the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh sitting in his throne to the firstborn of slave girl who is behind the millstones, and every firstborn of the beasts, and there shall be a great outcry in all the land of Egypt. 
the like of which there has not been and the like of which there will not be again. But against the Israelite, no dog will snarl from man to beast, so that you may know how the Lord sets apart Egypt and Israel. And all these servants of yours shall come down to me and bow to me, saying, Go out, you and all the people that is at our feet. And afterward, I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh's presence in a flare of anger. According to the previous chapter, Moses and Pharaoh had some angry exchanges of words. You remember that? Pharaoh told Moses, get out of my sight. Make sure you do not appear before me again. The day you see my face, you will die. And Moses replied, well, just as you say, I will never appear before you again. But here in these verses, we observe Moses was again speaking to Pharaoh. So we can see that God is patient. He was still hoping that Pharaoh would repent. And Moses risked death to warn Pharaoh. Moses told Pharaoh what was going to happen at midnight of the next day, which is every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh sitting on his throne to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the millstone and every firstborn of the beast. So this is the scariest of all the plagues. It will be enacted on every Egyptian, from the most powerful pharaoh and to the lowest of the low slave girls, even animals. There will be loud crying and screams all over the land. And what about the Hebrews? Will they suffer as well? According to the passage, they will not. Nothing dangerous will come close to them, not even the snarling of the dogs. Even with this final warning, seems like Pharaoh didn't care. Because at the end of the, the passage, I, we just read, Moses left the palace in a flare of anger. He was angry and frustrated, perhaps, at the needless judgment of death that soon take place because of Pharaoh's stubborn heart. Now verse 9 and 10. The Lord has said to Moses, Pharaoh will refuse to listen to you, so that my wonders may be multiplied in Egypt. Moses and Aaron performed all these wonders before Pharaoh, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let the Israelite go out of his country. Again, it is mentioned that God has hardened Pharaoh's heart. In the previous YouTube that I recorded, I've addressed this big question of whether it was God who hardened Pharaoh's heart or was it himself who hardened his own heart. You can listen to it again. So now I have another big question. Why God chose to kill the firstborn? First of all, God had already warned Pharaoh even before the first plague. He told him what would happen if he refused to let the Israelite leave Egypt. We know that the king hardened his heart and did not let God's firstborn son, which was Israel, depart from the land. At this point, you might ask, so that you said Israel was God's firstborn? Where in the Bible says that? Let's look at Exodus chapter 4, verse 22 and 23. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus said the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. So it seems as if God was having the Egyptians to pay with their firstborn for God's firstborn. Also, do you remember that in the first chapters of Exodus that Pharaoh instituted laws to kill the Israelite sons? He ordered them to be killed as soon as they were born, right? And furthermore, Pharaoh was has been 
taking hostage of God's firstborn and wouldn't free them. Pharaoh wanted them to remain as his slaves. This judgment, the most severe one, the one which Egypt had been warned way in the beginning, even before the first plague, was to be the last plague inflicted upon them. Again, we see God was patient and full of mercy. He cared very much for the beings that were formed in His image. If the loss of the harvest and the flocks and the herds would bring them, the Egyptians, to repentance, their firstborns would not suffer the final plague. But Pharaoh and his people had stubbornly resisted the divine command continually, and now the final blow was about to fall on them. Let's read the following verses from chapter twelve. Which included more instructions from God to the Israelites of what to do, and then next week I'll include some insight that I've learned and observed about whether the Egyptians actually had a chance to escape this plague if they choose to, even when Pharaoh had refused the offer. Now I move forward to chapter twelve, verse one. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, "This month shall be your beginning of months; it shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, 'On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb,'" Let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted it in fire, and with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boil it at all with water, but roasted it in fire. Its head with its legs and its entrails, you shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire, and thus you shall eat it, with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's passed over. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night. And will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Moses gave direction to the children of Israel concerning their departure from Egypt, and especially how to preserve their lives, actually their firstborn's life, from the coming judgment. Each family, alone or in connection with their neighbors, was to kill a lamb or a baby goat without blemish, and with a bunch of Hyssop sprinkled its blood on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the house, that the destroying angel coming at midnight might not enter the house. They were to eat the flesh roasted with unleavened bread and bitter herb at night, as Moses said, with your loin girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. 
and you shall eat it in haste, in a hurry. It is the Lord's Passover. And so the next week, we're going to answer the question, did the Egyptian had a chance to escape the last plague, even though the Pharaoh decided to resist the offer of mercy? Happy Sabbath.